I'm Jerry Buckland, and I'm the dean at Menno Simons College. And uh, it's great to see um, a, a wonderful crowd out this evening for our fifth presentation by uh, Dr. Eric Holt Jimenez, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Just before I do that, um, I just have a couple introductory comments, which are the same ones that I've made in the last five. So those of you who have come to more than one, you'll be thinking that you've seen this before. But I do want to sort of reiterate what we're doing in this project. What, what is the point here? And so let me just uh, highlight some of these things. So first of all, tonight's lecture is by Dr. Eric Holt Jimenez. And the title is Food Rebellions, Crisis, and the Hunger for Justice. Mano Simons College is a Mennonite college. We're a part of Canadian Mennonite University and we're based at the University of Winnipeg. We offer programs in conflict resolution, international development, and we have a series of courses and we have active faculty research projects in areas that interface development and conflict resolution. We also have a, a, a historic and, and strong practicum program. We're hosting this six-part series through our Esau Endowment. The Esau Endowment was set up by Paul and Esther Esau back in, in the 1980s with the goal of supporting visiting professors to come and enrich our teaching program. And so a key purpose here is to bring our students and community members at large out to these events that are being, um, where we have presenters coming from a variety of different backgrounds. The series is composed of public lectures. We have three courses running, two at Menno Simons College, one at CMU, Canadian Mennonite University Shaftesbury campus. We have uh, social media engagement and the publication of collected works of Esau Distinguished Scholars. You can learn more about the series uh, at the website uh, indicated there. And by the way, all four presentations so far have been videoed and you can go and, and watch those videos. And those presentations so far, and maybe this would help to kind of recap what we've done so far in these events. First of all, Martin Enns, who's a plant physiologist from the University of Manitoba, spoke on changing agriculture to sustain the world, a sequel. Dr. Enns talked about natural systems agriculture and how there is both a need and a benefit for agriculture to move more towards a more naturally focused type of agriculture. Dr. Shirley Thompson from the University of Manitoba, the Natural Resource Institute there, in October spoke on Harvest of Hope and Food Sovereignty in Northern Manitoba and gave a very interesting presentation on efforts in Northern Manitoba to build food sovereignty. In November, we had Dr. Haroon Akram Lodi from Trent University. He's the chair of the IDS program there. And he spoke on the topic of feeding the world is hunger inevitable. And I think you'll see some parallels between Dr. Akram Lodi's presentation and Dr. Holt Jimenez's presentation tonight. I think there's a very nice compliment, but also some very interesting uh, different directions that, that you'll see uh, Dr. Holt Jimenez takes on this point. Then in January, we had Dr. Nettie Weeb from St. Andrews College at the Univ University of Saskatchewan looking at the title, uh, This Land is Our Land, Reintegrating Earth, Eating, and Ethics. And um, she presented a very strong um, argument for the ethical basis for um, changing agriculture and rooting it more closely to community. Okay, so that leads us to our presentation tonight. And as I mentioned, it's Dr. Eric Holt Jimenez. Um, why are we doing this at Menno Simons College? Why are we running a series on food security and farm sovereignty in this urban campus right in downtown inner city Winnipeg? Well, we're doing it because we think this is a very important topic, a very important issue. And it's a very, I think, sad and ironic reality that our global economy is rapidly growing and yet Many of the poorest people are farmers, and farming in many countries has been undervalued and undersupported. Moreover, agriculture faces many major environmental challenges. And so, for instance, global climate change, the predictions are that it's the poorest countries and the poorest farmers who are going to suffer the greatest in terms of global climate change. So there are ver many environmental issues that require us to focus our attention on food and, uh, and farming. And 
A further reason why Menno Simons College wants to engage this topic is because it's very complex. We realize that there's a lot of complexity to these issues. So sometimes we hear about different perspectives, like the globalization perspective or the localization perspective. By the way, we had a very interesting meeting this afternoon with um, several people from Winnipeg-based food and, and um, farming organizations at Menno Simons College to talk about this and, and other issues to sort of unpack some of the, the complexity here. And uh, I think Dr. Holt Jimenez will be speaking to some of these, um, some of these issues. So there's, there's conflicting voices. You know, is, is high technology the answer? Or is social change the answer? Uh, finally, we hear often, you know, this uh, conflict between economic efficiency and environmental sustainability. So part of our goal at Mental Simons College is to bring dif uh, different voices together, talk about these complex issues, and as a community, understand them better and be better informed and be advocates for a more just and healthy food and farming system. So just by way of background to, to, to give background to Eric's presentation today, the, the title is Food Rebellions and it's a powerful title. In fact, one of our respondents today, Dr. Lois Edmond, is from Conflict Resolution Studies and we've asked her to kind of look at this, this issue from a conflict resolution perspective. And so, in some cases, hunger has led to, to food rebellions, has led, led to conflict. And um, so, for instance, um, despite global hunger falling by one-third since 1990, still one in eight people uh, worldwide suffer from chronic hunger. So this is, in a sense, a kind of structural conflict, that people are experiencing this, this hunger. Uh, the increased demand from other sectors for food has put pressure on the, the food and farming systems, and this creates additional challenges. Uh, in 2008 and again in 2011, global food prices rose to unprecedented levels, resulting in food riots in North Africa, Central and South America, and the Middle East and South Asia. So this is a, this is a very important and uh, challenging phenomenon that we need to look at. So, Dr. Holt Jimenez, uh, we've had the opportunity to get to know him over this past week. He's a wonderful and warm and giving person. He's shared with our students in many of our classes. He's attended several of our events and he has already contributed uh, so much in, in his role as our fifth visiting distinguished ESAW professor. He is the executive director of Food First, which is also known as the Institute of Food and Development Policy, based in Oakland, Oakland California. He has a lot of experience uh, working in agriculture and agroecology. He is a top-rated researcher. He's written many books, including uh, a recent book called Food Rebellions, Crisis and Hunger for Justice, so the, the, the background to this presentation. He helped start um, several years back a very interesting process that is called Campesina a Campesina, so farmer to farmer movement. This idea of farmers supporting one, an one another, a grassroots decentralized way to, to support agriculture. So he has a lot of experience in many countries in Latin America and has a rich overview of the food and farm organizations and movements around the world. So I'd like to ask you to help me to um, warmly welcome Dr. Holt Jimenez. Thank you, Jerry. Good evening, everybody. Um, well, if I want to start off first by thanking um, Menno Simons College and uh, Dr. Jerry Buckland and the staff and the faculty at the college for giving me such a warm welcome here. I've been here for three days now. I know warm is not the descriptor, um, but it is for the college. And um, they've taken very good care of me and uh, introduced me to uh, all kinds of people and have taken every, made every effort uh, to make me feel at home. And uh, today, uh, one of the faculty drove me all around Winnipeg and um, showed me the sights from inside the car, which was very nice. Um, and so it, I, it really is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, 
I want to say a, a, a word about Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, um, where I work. Uh, food First uh, has been around for about 40 years, and it was started by Francis Moore LePay, who wrote Diet for a Small Planet. Some of you folks my age and older are nodding. Um, so this was a, a revolutionary book at its time. I think it still is a revolutionary book because Francis Moore LePay identified uh, several things about uh, the problem of hunger which are still with us today, which are counterintuitive. One is that um, we have more than enough food to feed everybody. We have one and a half times enough food for every man, woman, and child. That was true 40 years ago. It's true today as well. Um, one in seven people were going hungry 40 years ago. One in seven people are going hungry today. Um, I defer from the FAO, who say it's only one in eight. They changed the way they measured it. Um, so, and we can talk about that later. But in any case, there are over a billion hungry people in the world today. And the world has never produced as much food as it produces now. So how are we to understand this? Um, one way of understanding these sort of contradictions is to look at crises. Because in a crisis, very often, sort of the, the root causes of, a, of, the, of, the, of the problem are sort of laid bare. And so I want to look at the food crises as a way of understanding the food system and a way of then um, suggesting what, uh, how, how can we also understand what's being done to solve the problem? Because um, I don't think that all of the proposals for ending global hunger will in fact end global hunger. I think some of them are making it worse. Um, but how will we know? Um, So back in 2009, we, much of the, of the public became aware that we had a problem because we had these food riots all around the world. And they happened in places where you would expect them to happen. Very poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa um, or in Asia. Uh, but they also happened in middle income countries like Mexico, and in developed countries like Italy and in like the United States. We had a food riot in Minneapolis. And um, hundreds of peoples were killed in these riots around the world. Uh, there were over 40 of them. And it wasn't for lack of food, but because there had been a price spike and people couldn't afford the food um, which was available. And uh, even though the press referred to these as riots, as we began to look into the issues at Food First, we realized that didn't quite characterize what was going on. Because even in places like Haiti, you know, a terribly poor country, um, in which people had been reduced to eating mud biscuits. You know the mud biscuits? Take a little bit of lard, you take some special clay, you make a biscuit or a cookie, whatever it is, and you, you pop that in the oven and you eat that to stave off hunger. They, they'd traditionally been used as sort of as a, a vitamin supplement, a mineral supplement for um, lactating women. Um, but they ended up being sold on the streets instead of food. Um, and even in Haiti, under those extreme conditions, when people rioted, they didn't um, assail the warehouses where the rice donations from the United USAID um, were kept. They stormed the National Palace and they drove the Prime Minister off the island because the government was incapable of solving a very simple equation. Here is the food, the food was there, here are the hungry people. Let's put them together, shall we, and so that people don't go hungry. The government was incapable of doing that. And so the people, people took out their ire against the government because, in fact, this was a rebellion against an unjust, inequitable, and quite frankly, criminal food system which lets people go hungry simply because they can't buy the food. So we began to call them rebellions. 
Um, and I think if you, if you look closely, you see that the combination is high prices and poverty, a lack of entitlement, and then certainly a lack of democracy. Had people been able to vote on it, they would have said, <laughs> we vote, we'd get the food. Well, they weren't asked for their vote. Um, now, these are the, the two uh, food crises, the price spikes. And uh, so you see one in 2008, the first spike, and then you see the second spike in 2011. This is the FAO's uh, food price index being graphed here over time. And um, you see this uh, tremendous fluctuation in prices here. You also see these uh, red lines grouped along the uh, apex of the spike. Those are the incidents of food riots or food rebellions. So you can see that when the food price index gets over, oh, 180, 190 or so, you get rebellions. You can also see that the general trend in food prices is an upward curve. So that one could project this curve and say that, well, sometime in, uh, to, they, at this particular study said in 2012 or 2013, if these trends continue, we could expect the world to enter into a permanent state of food rebellion. And that simply means that those countries which aren't able to distribute food fast enough or provide some kind of subsidies or whatever would expect to find, um, experience food rebellions and food riots. Well, this is obviously um, concerns a lot of people because in the second instance, in 2011, um, these riots the Arab Spring. Um, so it can lead to ungovernability, which, as it turns out, is, can be bad for business. If we look back through history, um, back into the 1900s, we see that basically, um, over the last century, and certainly the last 50 years especially, um, food prices have been going steadily down. Ever since we started tracking uh, the global food price index, um, with the exception of uh, a, a few notable spikes there, uh, having to do with wars, and then with the 1970 oil crisis, um, food prices have been going steadily down until we get to 2008, and then they shoot up beyond anything we've ever seen before uh, since we started tracking prices. Nonetheless, if you look at this graph from Science Magazine, um, you see that food production per capita has been going up since 1990. You can take this back. It's been going up for about 40 years. Um, but food production per capita has been rising about 12% a year. That means that every one of us is per capita, right? So every one of us should have gotten 12% more food a year. Well, clearly that's not what's happened because if you look at the um, measure of undernourishment, which are the yellow dots going across, basically undernourishment has remained the same, even though we're all supposed to be getting more food. And then, of course, this uh, correlates to absolute poverty, which has also remained basically the same. People are too poor to buy all this food which is being produced. And one has to ask why, um, particularly if it turns out that most of the poor people in the world and most of the hungry people in the world are farmers. And most of those farmers are women. 70% of the hungry people in the world are farmers. They're women. They produce over half of the world's food. They feed half the world and yet they're going hungry. So this is another contradiction we have to grapple with and, and attempt to understand. So if we look back at, the, at both of the um, food crises, we find that these happened during times of record harvests. The world had never produced as much in its history as it did in 2008 and 2011. So we have record hunger, record harvests, and we have record profits for the monopolies which control the seed, grain, fertilizer, and uh, retail trade. So if you look down here, we have these bumper profits in the last qu quarter of um, 2008. Archer Daniels Midlands, 
Grain Trader up 20%, Monsanto up 45%, Cargill up 86%. That in part is because Cargill also um, has, has an arm which sells fertilizer and they experienced uh, something like a 1,200% increase in profits at the height of the food crisis. General Foods, 61% increase in profits. You could say the same would be true for Walmart, Safeway, Tesco, Carrefour, all of the retail giants, um, all made fortunes while a billion people were going hungry. So if we look at this graph on the left here, and there's the, the uh, food price spikes again. The, if you look at the red line, the global food price index, uh, it spikes in 2008. It has kind of a little double hump there. And then it comes down um, as more food is, re is released into the market. And, um, and then it, it rises again in 2011. Um, and these are where these companies make tremendous profits. If you look at the local food price index, the blue line, so it goes up, it follows the, the international food price index. So the local food price index is what you pay in the store. Okay? The international food price index is the wholesale price on the global market. Um, and you can see that it doesn't drop after food prices go down globally the prices in the store stay high. So this is where the retailers make their money. Right? When you get these tremendous rises, that's where the, the wholesalers make their money, and then the retailers make their money afterwards um, between the two crises. So this is where you know, Walmart made it, became so flush with cash. They have so much cash, they don't know what to do with it. It's a recession. They don't know where to invest it. They've got a problem. They need another crisis. Because if you look at the graph on your right hand side there, that graph, which is pretty much congruent with the first graph, is the price of Monsanto's stock. And you can see that it goes up when the world food uh, price index goes up and then goes down afterwards when it drops. So Monsanto made all this money, and then suddenly its investors begin to pull out of the shareholders, begin to sell their shares, and the stock begins to drop when it looks like Monsanto isn't making a killing in the market anymore. Luckily for Monsanto, you can see that the price begins to rise again because we had another food crisis. Now, there was a lot of talk about the food crisis, particularly in the media. And um, they addressed what I call the proximate causes. Yes, climate is becoming a problem. We have very variable weather, extreme weather events. Um, there had been some droughts prior to, the, to 2008, particularly in, in um, Australia, with the wheat crops. And um, the rising meat consumption in India, China, and Brazil, um, particularly in China. Um, I remember at the time, our president said something to the effect that, you know, these Chinese have got to stop eating so much meat. Um, sort of blaming the Chinese for the rise in, in food prices. Of course, he didn't mention that the, the, the expansion of the um, of CAFOs, of confined animal feedlot operations in China, uh, was basically because of the expansion of Smithfield Tyson, an American company, into China, uh, and with loans from the World Bank. So um, it's not like this sort of happened uh, just out of consumer demand. This demand was constructed. Um, and of course, it did put uh, pressure and continue, and the, the and meat production, confined animal feedlots, continued to put pressure on grain prices uh, and land prices and water prices worldwide. We did have low grain reserves at the time, um, but nobody stopped to ask why did we have these low grain reserves when we've been producing, been overproducing grain for the last 50 years? Where are all the reserves? And of course, obviously, higher oil prices um, were, are going to raise food prices because most of our food travels something like 2,000 kilometers between producer and consumer. And so if 
transport costs go up, food prices will go up. Certainly fertilizer prices went up. That's where Cargill made all its money from Mosaic, its, its fertilizer arm. Um, there was a weak dollar and then there was a tremendous amount of, as a result of all of these, we got these bumps in, in, uh, in the market price of food and suddenly Wall Street becomes very interested and the commodity index funds triple and quadruple on the market. People are speculating with food. You know, we've just come off first the, the dot-com bubble, and then we came off the real estate bubble, and these are global bubbles, right? And after you come off the real estate bubble, where is everybody to invest their money? Okay. They've got a problem. They've got all this money, they've got to invest it. You don't want to keep it in dollars because the dollar is weak. Well, you can buy gold, and people did that. Um, you can grab land, and people are certainly doing that. But then you can invest it in the stock market, and you can speculate on the price of food. And that pumped the price of food up over the charts beyond anything we'd ever seen in the history of the food regimes. But nobody was talking about the root causes. Everybody wanted to talk about the superficial causes, the immediate causes, the proximate causes. But I'd, I would submit that the root causes are that we have a very vulnerable food system. When over 90% of our cropland is dedicated to just five crops and just a handful of varieties of those crops, that's a system which is highly vulnerable to both economic and environmental shock. Environmental shock, because we all know about the Irish potato famine. If you don't have diversity in your, in your crop base, you're, you expose yourself to any kind of pathogen, they're gonna wipe you out. And economic shock, because most of the wealth in the $6 trillion a year food system is held by a handful of monopolies and oligopolies. And so that means it's, ex and who are completely unregulated. The market is unregulated. Speculation is unregulated. And so that leads to a highly volatile food system uh, in economic and financial terms. Now, I also think that the root cause of this is that we have an industrial agri-foods complex controlled by the giant grain traders and processors, the seed and genetic engineering companies, and the retailers and distributors. They're the ones who made the money off everybody else's hunger. Um, they're the ones who control most of the legislation regarding our food and regarding investment. Um, they're the ones who, whose market power, whose monopolistic market power allows them to make money when the price goes down and to make money when the price goes up. How do we get here? Well, you know, one could go back to colonial times, but let's not go back that far. So the rise of the industrial agri-food complex, I think, um, has a, a seminal period during the Green Revolution. And I'm assuming most people know what the Green Revolution is in the 1960s and 80s, but basically, the Green Revolution was a campaign, a very well-financed campaign, um, to transfer the industrial model of food production from the global north to the global south. Now, why did we do this? Um, well, the sort of the highly publicized reason was to save the world from hunger. Um, I, I think that's quite disputable. And I say this because I was on the ground through the 70s and 80s uh, as the Green Revolution and the 90s, as the Green Revolution swept through Latin America. And I saw what the effects were. So you bring in fertilizer, bring in hybrid seed, and um, these are called high yielding varieties, right? They're actually high demanding varieties. They won't produce those high yields unless you provide water, uh, provide the fertilizer, and then you've got to start providing pesticides and herbicides and all these things. So they're actually quite expensive to use um, for most of the world's farmers. Um, and you need flat land because you need to mechanize because you're going to be growing monocrops and so you need to extend your land base because actually these monocrops that you're growing using a plantation mode of production are less productive in terms of net primary productivity than the smallholder farmers that 
are there before. So what happens with the Green Revolution is that the small farmers, the peasant farmers, um, who at that time produced even more of the world's food, uh, were unable to access the, these technologies. They didn't have land titles. The banks wouldn't give them any credit. Um, and so they were steadily pushed off the most fertile land, the bottom land, the land which could be mechanized by the farmers who could capitalize, the richer farmers, the bigger farmers. So who then applied these high yielding varieties and got tremendous results because they could afford all the inputs. Right? And they had cheap credit at the time. Um, where did the other farmers go? Well, they went to the slums in the cities around the world. And we get the misery belts around the major cities in the third world. And they went to hillsides, the very steep hillsides, seeking land and nutrients, um, steep, fragile areas for agriculture, areas where um, we would discourage agriculture. Um, but there was nowhere else to go. So in the very first instance, what happened was the Green Revolution doubled the amount of land under production. Because you have the smaller farmers being pushed up to the agricultural frontier, into the rainforest, onto the hillsides. And then you have the intensification of production in the best bottomlands by capitalized agriculture. So you get a tremendous flush of food. And the bottom drops out of grain. Right? Um, and certainly, both Canada and the United States uh, were victims of this. I remember in the United States at the time, Earl Butts, our Secretary of Agriculture, said, the world is starving from hunger, and everybody's dying. And the American farmer, I don't think he referred to you guys, but I, I'll say you probably are in that same category, is the best, most efficient farmer in the world. You can save the world from hunger. Here's the credit. Produce more. Plant fence row to fence row. No, wait. Tear out the fence rows. Buy your neighbor's land if you have to. Buy this new big machinery. Get all the new hybrids. And everybody who could did. And um, farmers hawked themselves up to their eyeballs. Um, and, and you know the, the price of land began to go up. And the price of land began to go up faster than the, price, than the index of inflation. So, rather, so it made sense to get a loan take that money and buy land with it, because that value was going up. And you'd pay it off eventually. So you can just imagine. You've got the Green Revolution in the South with tremendous burst of productivity. You have the, the, input, the impulse in the North to grow more food. And they overproduce. The bottom drops out of the market, and then the banks begin to call in their loans. The third world defaults on its debt. We have the debt crisis. And then um, and farmers default. And that's where, in the United States at least, we drop down from something like 3% of our population farming to less than 2% farming. Um, this sets up a debt crisis in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and also a debt crisis throughout the third world. Now, in the north, what you can do if a farmer defaults on their debt is you just take their land. The bank just takes the land, and they did. But you can't just sort of take Brazil, or Mexico, or Indonesia. What can you do? How can these private banks get their money back? Hmm? Well, enter the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So the World Bank ran around the world, basically advising these governments um, to restructure their economies and to borrow some money from the bank to be able to pay back the loans to the private banks in the North. So the World Bank is giving away money. This is public money. This is our money. You pay into it just like we do. Um, giving public money to governments in the Global South to pay off private banks in the Global North. But 
if you wanted that money, you had to go and talk to this guy over here from the International Monetary Fund. You had to sign a contract with the International Monetary Fund. And the International Monetary Fund was very clear. You had to liberalize your economy. You had to remove all your tariff barriers. You had to dismantle all your marketing boards, which might control supply, so you didn't overproduce. Um, you had to devalue your currency. You had to privatize uh, all of your state industries um, and privatize even your, you know, your education, privatize your water, privatize absolutely everything, and uh, open it to the global market. And you had to stop growing food. You had to start growing non-food export crops, luxury crops, coffee, banana, um, vanilla, bananas. I mean, it's food, but you know, it, these are basically luxury crops. These are ca good cash crops. In other words, don't grow any more grain. All right? Why? Well, because these can be sold on the global market, and you can get foreign exchange, and you can pay off your loans to the northern banks. And it just so happens we're subsidizing our farmers in the north, and we don't want you competing with them. So the next stage in the construction of this industrial agri-foods complex were the free trade agreements. This sort of free trade mania from 1990s through the present day, and, and the rise of the WTO, NAFTA, CAFTA, whatnot. And what these agreements did was they sort of baked the structural adjustment policies of the 80s and 90s into international law, into international treaty. Mm -hmm. Because you sign the international treaty, and it basically says you're going to abide by all of these structural adjustment policies, all of these liberalization policies. And we call it neoliberalism, right? Well, why would they do that? Quite simply, because they didn't want any sort of democratic processes voting these policies out. And as long as they were in international treaties protected by international law, like the World Trade Organization, citizens could not get their hands on these policies. You could vote presidents in, you could vote them out, didn't matter, the treaty stood. Mm -hmm. So the policies of structural adjustment and of neoliberalism are protected then by these uh, free trade agreements. And lest we think that these trade agreements are about trade, these agreements are about giving corporations rights, rights to invest. And if you try to stop them from investing, then you have to pay them for their loss of potential revenue. That's basically it. So if you do anything like oh, apply your labor laws or your environmental regulations, these are trade distorting. You're, pre you're preventing um, uh, free investment, liberal investment. And through the World Trade Organization and through the uh, free trade agreements, um, you can be taken uh, uh, to court, basically, to be into the World Trade Organization court. And they can sue you. So these provide rights for corporations to sue for the right to invest, um, among other things. And then what do we get? Well, the North continues to subsidize directly and indirectly their production. The South can't. It doesn't have enough money to subsidize. So, but they've dropped all their trade barriers. So the North dumps all of its grain into the South, driving the farmers in the South out of business. Well, what are the results? The global South produced back in the 70s a billion dollar surplus every year of food. Now they have an 11 billion dollar deficit. The South has become dependent upon the North for its basic grains. Industrial agriculture has become dominant worldwide. It uses up 80 percent of the world's water, all of the water, drinking water, rainwater, irrigation water, groundwater, all of it. 80 percent of the world's water. It's terribly inefficient. And it produces something like 20% of the world's greenhouse gases. We've lost a good 75% of our crop diversity. You know, in Indonesia, I mean, sorry, in um, the Philippines, uh, prior to the Green Revolution and the industrialization of uh, rice production, 
um, there were probably about 2,000 different varieties of rice being planted by small farmers around the island. And it would, would not be unusual on one farm to find 15 or 20 varieties of rice. Mm. Tremendous diversity. Um, well, if you wanted credit, production credit, and if you wanted to be able to sell your rice on the international market um, or to the, um, to the wholesalers, you had to buy Green Revolution rice. And there were only about four varieties. So if you go into the Philippines today, in the fields, you're going to find three or four varieties of rice. And where are all the other varieties of rice? They're in a seed bank in Cavite, in a big refrigerator, rotting. And I know that they're rotting because I visited. I had a, a class at the time. I was teaching through Boston University, and we took a class, and we actually visited the Philippines, and we visited the International Rice Research Institute. And, you know, they showed us all the different varieties of rice in the field, and they had a, a much fancier slideshow than this that they showed us. And um, they took us down to the big refrigerator, and there was all the rice, you know. So, and my students, you know, sort of challenged the whole notion of putting rice in a refrigerator and what had happened to all the farmers and this and that. And, and, and the technician who uh, attended to us was very nice and, and answered all the questions and whatnot. And then my students left and I stayed on to talk to him. And this was a man who'd spent most of his career in the refrigerator um, with a tremendous commitment to agrobiodiversity. Tremendous commitment to all of these varieties of rice. He knew the value of this rice in all these varieties. And he confessed to me, says, we're losing it. You know, you have to plant this stuff out every few years. You can't just leave it in the refrigerator. You've got to take it out, plant it out, reharvest it, put it back in. So we can't keep up. We're losing these varieties of rice. So next time someone tells you about the doomsday vault that um, Gates and Monsanto and, and Norway have uh, built up above the Arctic Circle where they, they're saving all these varieties. Don't think it's necessarily going to save us um, when GMOs crash. Anyway, we've seen that we have this increase of food per capita, but we also get an increase in the number of hungry people. Um, and certainly the costs of trade liberalization uh, have been great around the world. If you just look at sub-Saharan Africa, the costs have been about the same as uh, the amount that the region has received in foreign aid. Why not just not <laughs> do trade liberalization and then we wouldn't have to give away the foreign aid? Um, and certainly in the Americas, we've seen a huge demographic shift as farmers have been pushed out of agriculture and moved, uh, immigrated to the north looking for jobs. Um, just within the first few years of NAFTA, over a million Mexican smallholders went bankrupt and moved to the U.S. And then we see the rise of the, of the great monopolies, ADM, Cargill, Bungie, controlling 80% of the grain, Monsanto with a, a fifth of the seeds. If you add Syngenta and DuPont, and, um, DuPont onto that, it's even more, um, something like 90%. And then the benefits from all of this tend to go to northern companies from the Green Revolution. Now, because of the fact that these food riots are happening and it's making things ungovernable, even though they are uh, very profitable for the monopolies, the G20 gets together in, in Italy in 2009 and then in, in France again in 2011 and decides they better pump some money back into agriculture. They'd better rebuild agriculture in the global south. That, that this is untenable. Now, the FAO at the time said we need about $40 billion to rebuild agriculture. I'm not quite sure how they made that calculation, and I'm not, and I have no doubt of what type of agriculture they were talking about. They weren't talking about rebuilding peasant agriculture. They were talking about establishing industrial agriculture. So it's going to take $40 billion. Well, the G20 said they would, they would give $22 billion. But then, the world recession kicks in, and not much of that is even any new money, and less than a 20th of that money has actually been handed over. So we get a number of initiatives to combat hunger. In the United States, we have the Feed the Future Global Food Security Act, um, which is about 
uh, food aid primarily, uh, the Global Harvest Initiative, uh, uh, private sector initiative, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa is Bill Gates's foray into Africa uh, to spread the Green Revolution, even though for over 20 years the consultative group on international agricultural research had invested a third of its budget in Africa trying to establish the Green Revolution and had failed, Bill thinks he can do it. So the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa called AGRA, these promises, and then now the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which is sort of an alliance between a private-public partnership to establish um, commercial Af uh, agriculture in Africa. Now, the steady drumbeat behind all of these initiatives is that we need to increase production by at least 70% over the next 50 years. Some say double it over the next 50 years, or we're all going to die. Um, well, we wouldn't all die. None of us here would die, I'm pretty sure, um, if that was true anyway. But the, the, in this increase in productivity to be able to feel, feed 9 billion or feed 10 billion, remember, we already produce enough to feed 10 billion. So we need to produce twice as much to actually feed, but we don't. So we need to produce twice as much to actually feed 10 billion is sort of what they're saying. Um, and the proposals are basically another green revolution. The industrialization of agriculture, but this time it's with GMOs. And this time there's a new focus on smallholders, uh, extending the green revolution to smallholders. Well, the problem with smallholders is that, you know, they take on this credit, take on this debt, take on these very expensive technologies, and then they get clobbered in the market um, because they're not subsidized. And so they tend to go out of business. And so, and then you tend to get tremendous land concentration. And this time round, the Green Revolution, which in the first iteration was financed with public money, is largely market-backed. This is private public partnerships. Why? <laughs> because everything's been privatized. There's no state left, particularly in the third world. There's very little capacity at the state level to finance anything. Um, so the Green Revolution doesn't really have the state partner that it had before. So it's trying to entice the private sector um, into uh, extremely depressed areas in the Global South in order to develop agriculture. Um, now, there have been some dissenting voices. This is one. Well, actually, this is about 400. The International Assessment of Agricultural Science, Knowledge, and Technology for Development was a project uh, financed primarily by the World Bank. It's called the ISTAD. And you can Google this, and you can download anything you want from it. Uh, it's huge. Uh, download the summaries. I, and um, this is a very interesting story. Monsanto and Syngenta, through the Crop Life Association, which is basically um, their think tank, um, went to the World Bank and approached James Wolfenson, who was the president of the World Bank at the time, um, and said, you know, people don't believe that we can save the world for hunger, from hunger. We need a study that shows, some sort of global study, which, which basically shows that we can do this. And James Wolfenson, who was a man who owed many favors, said, oh, we do that. That's exactly what we do. We've done a global assessment on dams. We've done a global assessment on extractive industries. It says it's very easy. It's formulaic. You, you hire a notable scientist. You put together a team of uh, experts. And then you do the, do the study. It takes a couple of years, a few million dollars. And, uh, and then we have the study. So Monsanto said, great. Let's do it. Now, Monsanto didn't do its homework, because every single study that the World Bank has done, um, the World Bank has ended up rejecting the findings of the study and has shelved it and tried to bury the study as quickly as possible. And the same thing happened here. Um, the difference here was that the study included 400 scientists, and it took over four years. And you know, sometimes, not always, but sometimes scientists do an interesting thing. Rather than start with a solution, like the GMOs, they start by looking at the problem. And that's what these scientists did. And after four years of looking at the problem, this is their 
main conclusion, that basically we've got to radically change the food system to avoid social breakdown and environmental collapse. And too bad for Monsanto and Syngenta, they found out that GMOs were not needed. In fact, they were irrelevant to ending world hunger, precisely because they didn't raise intrinsic yields. Even though that's sort of claimed ad nauseum in the press and by, even by some scientists who know better. Um, and they also found that free trade agreements, remember these are, the, these are the two pillars of the solution for ending hunger. Another green revolution based on GMOs and we need more free trade. Free trade agreements basically don't help poor people in the global south and those are the ones who are going hungry because 90% of the benefits go to northern countries and only about $2 per farmer per year goes to people in the south. Well, you're not going to end poverty or hunger that way. And what they found was that, in fact, agroecology and an emphasis on local food systems rather than global food systems was a much better way forward. Held a lot more promise in terms of uh, improving livelihoods and improving agriculture and feeding the world. Now, since then, there's also been uh, quite a bit of work done. Uh, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, IATP, Sophia Murphy and Tim Wise put out a report recently uh, that basically said that we weren't going to be able to solve the food crisis unless we reduced financial speculation on the commodities market. We've got to stop gambling with our food. Well, I don't actually buy shares, but Wall Street has got to stop gambling with the food. We've got to stop the land grabs going on around the world because it's pushing people off the land. And we've got to limit the further expansion of biofuels. Biofuels, basically, you know, if on 100 hectares, you can, 10 families can make a living. If biofuel, doing small scale farming, if biofuels come in, basically, you have one or two very poorly paid jobs. Um, so you're destroying livelihoods as biofuels advance around the world. Um, so, I get this question, one gets the question all the time, oh, but if we go back to traditional agriculture, you know, can it possibly feed everybody? Well, first of all, there's no reason to go backwards. Um, there are examples of sustainable agriculture all around the world based on agroecological principles. They're highly productive um, and they're quite modern and they're, they work to scale. In other words, they really work for small farmers. And this is a, a study from the University of Michigan. They, looked, they did a mega study on uh, almost 300 examples comparing uh, alternative and conventional agriculture. They looked at 91 different studies. And what they found was that the world could easily support a population of 10 or 11 billion people um, by 2100. And there are other studies from the United Nations. This one is by Jules Pretty, that ag organic agriculture in Africa um, basically increases agricultural productivity and can raise incomes. So these are formal studies done by scientists which, are, which don't get any press whatsoever. Um, but the science is there, and certainly the examples are there. This is one I was associated with, the Campesino Campesino movement. It wasn't unusual for these farmers using agroecological methods to increase their yields by 100 or 200 percent um, and reduce their reliance on external inputs like pesticides and fertilizers. Um, I think that small farms really are a planetary asset. Um, they can help cool the planet. They're very resilient models of sustainability. And they're a sanctuary for GMO-free GMO crops and agrobiodiversity. They're, this is where we hold our agrobiodiversity in vivo rather than in vitro under the ice somewhere. Because all those seeds, if you don't know how to grow them, <laughs> if you don't know how to associate them, if you don't know how to cook them, it really, genetic material itself doesn't get you terribly far. So what we're talking about here, and when you pull all this together, what is the option? And I think the option is food sovereignty, which is to take back our food systems and democratize them, particularly in, in favor of the poor. The poor are the majority. The poor are the ones who stand to benefit. When the poor are better off, we're, we are all better off. Um, and this is a call from, from uh, Via Campesina. Uh, peasant federation uh, covering over two million farmers and uh, said that 
it's not enough to have food security. In fact, we can't have food security unless we have food sovereignty, unless we actually control um, our production and control our markets. I work with a young man with a project in inner city Oakland, and um, they're establishing urban farming and trying to feed their communities in these food deserts, the underserved communities. And we had a conversation about food security and food sovereignty, and I asked him why he believed in food sovereignty. He said, well, I come from the criminal justice system. He said, I was food secure in jail. I don't want that again. I want to control my food. Um, why is it that we don't hear more about this? And I think that we have to, the only way to understand this, I'm going to go slightly over time, is we have to realize that we have a capitalist food system and that it's going to act the way capitalism acts. So we have to understand capitalism if we are going to understand our food system. Um, and if you look at the work of uh, Phil McMichael and Harriet Friedman, Harriet's from the University of Toronto, they characterize what they call food regimes. And as rule governed structures of production and consumption of food on a world scale, think of all of the institutions and all of the rules which control our food from seed to fork. Um, now, there have been three of these through history. The first being the colonial food regime in which these produced cheap food so the North could industrialize. After World War II, the flow of food is reversed. The North begins to overproduce. It has to destroy the food production capacity of the colonies, of the former colonies, and we begin dumping food into the global south. Today, we moved into a new phase called the corporate food regime. It's much more complicated. Food, food goes north, food goes south. Companies go south, companies go north. It's uh, basically the dominance of the monopolies, um, the World Bank, the IMF, and certainly big philanthropy like Bill Gates are the ones calling the shots in the corporate food regime. This regime, because it is a capitalist regime, always goes through two periods, as does capitalism. You go through a period of liberalization, where markets are unleashed and deregulated, and then you go through a period of reform, when you begin to regulate production and consumption and markets and these things. Why? Because if markets were allowed to um, were allowed to function without any regulation indefinitely, they would eventually destroy the social and the material basis for the reproduction of the system itself. So you usually have a big crash, like in 1929 or a couple of years ago, after a period of liberalization. And then you can get a period of reform, which can come in. Now, these may appear distinct, but they're really two sides of the same system. The thing about reforms is they don't come in just on the goodwill of reformers. Reformers are usually too weak to institute reforms. You need what Karl Polanyi called a counter movement. In other words, you need social pressure to force reformers to institute reforms to create political will. And if you think about the 1929 stock market crash, which followed the Roaring Twenties period of liberalization, and then the New Deal, which Roosevelt institutes in the United States and then affects policy all around the world, this is exactly what happened. The United States was becoming ungovernable. There was a counter movement against the system, which had put so many people out of work. Um, and Roosevelt is then able to introduce reforms. Otherwise, he couldn't do it. So, I'm going to end with this slide, and I guess I'm going to end with a, with a provocation, if this hasn't been provocative enough. So we know about the corporate food regime. It has a neoliberal and a reformist tendency. Right now, the neoliberal aspect of the, the tendency in the corporate food regime is, is completely hegemonic, retrenching, calling the shots. We can't get any reforms passed. Right? The reformists within the, within the regime are quite weak. They're always there at the same time, but you know, the regime flips back and forth depending on which one is strongest. And the neoliberals basically believe in, in the free market and, and uh, free enterprise, and you'll see all these uh, the usual suspects in there, the w World Trade Organization, the IFC, the World Bank, et cetera, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they have a corporate orientation, and they're based on a model of overproduction. Um, and if you have to look into the intellectual uh, underpinnings, go to the World Bank and look at the 2009 development report, um, which sort of lays out what I've just been describing. The reformists basically believe in all the same things, except they think there should be safety nets. 
and we should have niches, you know, maybe for, we should try and, try and mainstream things like fair trade or organic, things like that. But don't touch the structure, don't touch the WTO, don't touch the farm bill, don't, don't introduce any big changes. But don't let so many people go hungry. The counter movement, I think, is the food movement. And I think this is true around the world. There are all kinds of social movements contesting this corporate food regime around the world. Peasant unions, um, consumer unions, uh, CSAs, uh, farm to school programs, um, urban farms, gardens. There's a tremendous diversity of people who are fed up and for whom the corporate food regime is just not working and they're pushing back. But I would say there are also two tendencies. One is somewhat transitional, believes more in food justice and empowerment and about people getting good access um, to food. And that's where, these are the doers. These are the ones who, who know how to grow the gardens, who know how to set up food policy councils, who know how to um, set up CSAs and, and this type of thing. And yeah, a lot of it uh, is uh, agroecologically produced and, and um, they're all about the right to food. And I think that the, the ISTAD uh, informs this uh, tendency to a tremendous degree. And there's a much more radical uh, tendency, a transformational tendency, which I think is discourses food sovereignty. It's about changing the rules, not just changing the practices, but changing the rules. Because if we don't change the rules, then the, the new practices really don't have a chance against the established regime. And m more than empowerment, they're more about entitlement and redistribution and about dismantling the power of the monopolies and redistributing land where it's been concentrated. Um, so here's the, here's the thought. We know that the food regime won't change unless there's a strong counter movement. We know that the reformists are very weak. So the reformists reach out sort of into this transitional progressive trend in the food movements and try to bring them in. So they could, making the reformists stronger so they can institute reforms. I actually don't think that will bring about reforms. Because I think what that will do, I think it will split the movement. And it will reduce us to reforms around practices rather than transformational reforms around the structures, the rules, the institutions that govern our food regime. So I think that it's important to build alliances between the, the food sovereignty trends and more of the, the food justice trends within the food movements, to build a powerful food movement that might have a chance of creating the political will, enough social force to create the political will to introduce reforms. So the reformers can actually propose some reforms and get them through parliaments and Congress and whatnot. Um, and then the question, of course, is are these going to be the same old reforms, which simply reinforce the system over time, or are they going to be transformational reforms, which bring us something new, which I think we desperately need if we, I agree with the ISTAD, if we're going to avert planetary disaster. And I'll leave you on a positive note, I think that these sorts of alliances are being built around the world. And if you look carefully, they're probably happening right under your eyes. Um, one example might be all the food policy councils springing up uh, in the Americas, in, in, the North, in North America, where you have people from uh, the food justice uh, communities and food sovereignty communities, and some people from food security as well, working together to try and change the rules at the local level, because it's so difficult to change them nationally. So we see these trends around the world, and I think these are very promising trends whether they'll happen quickly enough so we can build a movement strong enough to actually transform the food system is yet to be seen. The alternative, I think, is fairly predictable. Um, what we want is a future with new possibilities. Thank you very much.